it's right that we should talk about freedom and oppression today. That's really what the message is about. It's about freedom and oppression. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus is coming to his hometown of Nazareth. When you read the verses just prior to this story, this reading done a moment ago, you find out that Jesus had been baptized by John the Baptist, and he's starting to gather some followers around him. And then it said he came back to Galilee, and when he got to Galilee, uh, he began to preach in the synagogues. And it says in the verses just prior to our reading that he wandered the country of Galilee, and he was going into these little synagogues, and at these little synagogues he was preaching the good word of God. He was speaking the good news, it says. And then at this point, and where our reading begins, it says, then Jesus came to Nazareth. Now, it doesn't tell you what's going on in Nazareth and why Jesus came to Nazareth. I think he came to Nazareth because he came to visit his mother. Just like you should. Visit your mom and dad. Call them on the phone. These days, it's on cell phone. It's free. That's what he was doing. He came to Nazareth. It says it doesn't give any particular reason, but I think he came to see mom. He had to mow the grass, check how the garden was doing, see how mom is going, what what she needed, yell at the brothers and sisters for not doing what they're supposed to be doing. And then it says in the text that he did what was customary. So when the day of Sabbath came, he did what was customary. And in that household, you can imagine Joseph and Mary raising Jesus and and his brothers and sisters, and, and that what was customary is you would go to the synagogue on Sabbath. And so he went to the synagogue. By this point, he was known for speaking and teaching, and, and he was known for wandering the countryside. So when he came into the synagogue, it wasn't uncommon that they would have someone read the scriptures. I expect that when Jesus grew up in the synagogue, he was known for being a pretty attentive, good Jewish boy who knew the, the scriptures and was involved in worship and active in the faith community that was there, just like any number of our children here in our congregation. And so when he came back to visit, it's obvious that he was out preaching and teaching the word now, that they would ask him to read the lessons. Now it says that they pulled out the scroll. You see in the synagogues there would be a big box, kind of called tabernacle, big box, ornate box that had been made. Inside that tabernacle would have been very big scrolls of the scriptures. So, you know, we always talk in scriptures about the enemies of Jesus. They were, the Sadducees were one group, and then there were the Pharisees. And who were the Pharisees' buddies? There was the, it's usually called the blank and the Pharisees. The, it was the Sadducees, Pharisees, and the scribes. So you always hear about the scribes and the Pharisees? Well, that's what the scribes did. They copied the scrolls. The scrolls that were being used in the synagogue worship that Jesus was doing Scribes had copied those. They were very, very expensive. They were hand done on parchment, rolled up. And it says in in our reading for today that they pulled out the scroll, just like we would have in our liturgy a certain place where we do the readings. We just did a minute ago. They had a certain place where they would do the readings as well in their synagogue worship. And so they pulled out the scroll, and it says in the scriptures that they handed the scroll of Isaiah to Jesus. They gave him the scroll. And he pulled out the scroll. Now, we don't, what we don't know, it, we don't know what the prescribed reading for that day was. It could have been Isaiah 61. Uh, but it says that Jesus unrolled the scroll and he began to read Isaiah 61 and he read verses 1 and 2. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news. Now, listen, hold your fingers up. To the poor, hold your hand up. To the poor. And he has sent me to proclaim pr- uh, freedom for the prisoners. Two. And recovery of sight for the blind, three, and to release the oppressed, four. You see that? And then to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So he came to bring good news to the poor, to, to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, to recover the sight for the blind, and to, replace, and to release the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then Jesus, it says in the scriptures, Jesus reads this text, and he says, look at, look at folks, look what the Messiah is supposed to do. This was a messianic chapter. Everybody knew it was a messianic chapter. Everybody knew exactly from childhood to, to death, life, birth to death, that a good Jewish boy and girl, the family, knew that the Spirit of the Lord is on me. That was the sign of Messiah. Then it says in the, in the lesson, when you look at it in Luke 4, it says when Jesus finished the reading, he sat down. When in, in Jewish rabbinical teaching, when they sat down, that was the sign that the rabbi was going to teach. In our world, when the reading is done, I'm sitting there, right? And when the reading's done, I get up and stand. That's the signal to you that I'm going to speak. In that culture, it's just the opposite. So Jesus sat down. 
And it was a signal that he had something to share, which would have been common in the day. The, anybody who was up there would have, been, would have spoken to the text, might have done a summary of what it said. Jesus always took it a different direction. And this is what he says. Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Today, look at me. Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. What you're hearing is that the poor will be rescued with good news, that the prisoner will be set free, that there'll be the recovery of the sight of the blind and to release the oppressed. That's happening today. Look at me. Look at me. A profound, strong word being said at his childhood synagogue of Nazareth. A synagogue that maybe had 30 or 40 people in attendance that day. And he said, look at me. This is being fulfilled now. Now. And what he says with those four things is he's saying to the people of Nazareth, you see those four things? Listen, folks, you're the oppressed. You Nazareth people, you may not think you're oppressed, but you are the oppressed. And then the question always comes up, what is oppression? What is oppression? Peter, come here, Peter. Yes, come here, come here. Yes, come here. That means you have to get up and walk. This is a scary moment for you, Peter. I I know. You've got to walk a little bit faster. They're filming the message. Yeah. Yeah, I want you to stand right here. All right, stand right here. That's it. All right, stand down one step because I'm short. All right, and I want you to hold the sermon. Don't lose it. All right, now, when I think of oppression, this is, and I want you to think about your own life with oppression. You're safe. I'm not going to hurt you. Uh, <laughs> there are too many people watching. Uh, this, this, is, this is what I, I'm going I'm to push down on your shoulders in a minute. But I really want you to think about how you would define oppression in your life. And one of the things that I saw when I think about oppression is you begin to feel like you're being pushed down. Isn't that one kind of oppression? Are you being pushed down? Do you feel something? Yeah. I know you're strong. Uh, and you're trying to resist it. Stop resisting. Uh, but, but you feel the pushing down. You feel it. Oh, he's bending his knees. Uh, you feel it. Anybody feel like, don't raise your hands. You ever feel like this in life? where you feel so oppressed that the shoulders are coming down? You just think, how can I bear any more weight? How can I do any more? H- how about this one? No- another way I look at oppression. You, you feel squeezed? Feel squeezed? Do you feel squeezed? Yeah. You feel something? Good. Yeah. Yeah. You, you see, you feel the squeeze coming in the shoulders, being pushed down, being squeezed. And the fact of the matter is, everyone in here, when we talk about oppression, we're talking about life being pushed down on us and squeezing us into a small little box. And sometimes you just want to scream, let me out of the box. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of it. And so when Jesus speaks and talks about prisoners and poor, talks about the blind, And then he's talking about the oppressed. He's saying, all of you who are caught in the box where you're being squeezed and pushed down, I have come to set you free. Me. I've come to set you free. Thank you, Peter. Yes, applaud for Peter. (laughs) Peter didn't know I was going to do that to him. Yeah, he'll talk to me about it later. Paul says it this way in Galatians chapter 5 when he talks about the fruits of the flesh. These are oppression. He, he gives us a whole, list of, a whole list of oppressive things. He says the acts of the nature are obvious. These are oppressive, folks. Think about our culture and think about your life. Sexual immorality. Impurity and debauchery. Debauchery is out of control living. Think about the rise of pornography in our culture. Idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions and factions and envy and drunkenness and orgies and the like. And Paul's clear, don't live that way. Do not live that way. 
But when I read that list, I think this is the world we live in and it keeps pushing us down and squeezing us tight and keeps us in this little box that we can't ever get out of. We're trapped. We're trapped. And maybe you know that feeling of being trapped. Last week, I did an interview with Michael Roth Vandenenter. It's Vandeventer. Michael lived and grew up in East Germany all the way during the, his 20s into his young adulthood. And he lived in an environment that was very, very oppressive. When he was uh, 18, and, and, and some of you will remember this, in the United States we had it as well, he was drafted. There used to be a draft in the United States, and every man had to serve in the military. And when he was 18, he was drafted, and he served 18 months in the East German military. I've asked him to share a bit of his story on videotape, and we sat down and we filmed three segments. And we're going to talk about what it means to be oppressive and what does it mean to be free. Michael's family were people of faith living in East Germany. They made a distinctive decision to be people of faith. Let's, let's hear the first five minutes. And so, Michael, I, I am delighted that you're, gonna, you're willing to share your story with our congregation today and share something of your life experience. So, I know you weren't born when the wall went up and East, east was divided from West, but what, what, do you, what do you remember hearing from your dad? Because he would have known, your dad and mom, they, they would have known what happened. What, what, do you, what stories do you remember them telling you? Well, at the time it, where it became really critical was when the wall was actually... Uh, built right, so they tried to prevent the exodus from the from the Soviet zone into the western zones, and um, so that was a overnight uh, endeavor. Mm -hmm. And uh, my dad at the time he told me he was in college himself, so he studied chemistry at the time, and um, friends of his, you know, they got together in the morning, what do we do? They listened to the news, um, the, the borders will be closed. And uh, a lot of them just made a decision to just go and run and try to make it over to the western side. Um, knowing or not knowing mm -hmm. if they, when they would come back, when do they see their families and so forth. And at that time my dad said he made a decision to uh, stay with his family, stay, stay on that side so he can be with his family. And I have a hunch he did not realize how long they, the wall would be up no. and what that would mean for his family. Right, nobody knew. I mean, it yeah. was a crazy thing. Everybody thought it was temporary. Yes, they want to prevent something. They, want, they ordered something, closing the borders. But everyone expected that, okay, they're going to open it again. But uh, that took like 40 years before that. Yeah, 40 years, 40 years. So when you live in that kind of a, a world, in that communist world of that day, what was life actually like? So if you think of uh, uh, the political system, there was a one-party system, more or less. There was no freedom of speech. There was a heavy infiltration of the Stasi, the German secret service. And even as a, as a child going th uh, through school or in school, you, you notice that. You know your teachers, you have certain teachers that watch exactly what you say, even your friends. Some of your friends were already, uh, so to speak, recruited and, and would say things. Uh, so you always had to be very careful what you say. You would never say what you think outside of your mm -hmm. own four walls, mm -hmm. never. So you learn to be very quiet, very quiet, and uh, and say what others want to hear, or don't say anything. But for sure, don't say, don't blurb anything mm -hmm. out, because mm -hmm. that could get you in trouble. So there were always there were spies everywhere. There were spies everywhere. So so when uh, your family, and, and the thing that caught me with your story, is that your family were believers in Christ Jesus, living in East Germany when the East was definitely anti-Christian. But your dad and mom, they made a definite decision of what their household would be like. And so you're born into that environment and you're raised um, as a believer in Jesus 
in your household. What did that mean living in East Germany? Well, it put you aside, right? This was an atheist type of uh, society. So it was why churches were there. They were open. There were not many people who made that commitment of going there every Sunday because uh, going there every Sunday, walking by the houses, everybody would know where you're going and that you are one of them, right? So just going out of the house Sunday morning is a commitment you make by raising eyebrows uh, with the system, right, uh, with, with the, in society. So you definitely made the statement, I, I'm different and I have a private life and I believe in something that might be different from what everyone else believes in or not believes in. And certainly what the East German government wanted you to believe. And certainly what the East German government wants you to believe. So, so it, it marked you. Yes. It marked you. It marked all of us. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a statement. It's, it's much different here. Here you have the freedom. You go to a church, you don't even think about it because uh, nobody even pays attention. Mm -hmm. But they're doing that is it uh, precludes a discussion at home say should we go because everyone you know will ask questions Monday morning so to speak right so oh I saw you out there what uh, where did you go why do you do that uh, you know are you hiding something so you you expose yourself to those types and of underneath things. all of that is the secret police watching so you see what oppressiveness is in his world when he grew up no freedom of speech, no ability to travel. Goodness, he'd go to his youth group and he knew there'd be a spy in the youth group. They had to file a monthly report. The liberty to be who you want to be is taken away. You're pushed down, you're squeezed, put in a little box. He speaks to what does it mean to be oppressive and his family makes a decision they, each family in East Germany had to make a decision. His family made a deci decision. We will stay the course with what we believe. We believe that Jesus is Lord. And for them, going to church on Sunday morning was a testimony of quiet resistance to a, an atheistic communist government. And they'd get up in the morning and they'd walk to church and people would see them walking through the windows. They'd look out through their window on a Sunday morning, see them going to church or coming home. And they were marked and identified. They were set apart. It became their story of their life. And certainly the story of Michael growing up in that life, that this became part of his story. And this is what you see out of this, is oppression, my friends, shapes us. So if you're feeling shoulders pushed down, you're feeling squeezed in, you're feeling like you're in that little box, you can't figure out how to bust through that box, you can never get out of that box. Well, oppression does shape us. It doesn't mean oppression wins, but it does shape us. Does that make sense? It does create in us a view of life. But it's not the end view. But it does shape us, and it does mold us. And it did mold their family. And it did have every part of their life was impacted by this oppressive government. And they had to figure out how to respond to it or concede to it. Let's look at the second videotape. There are certain places in life, in, in German life in East Germany, that really did have a pronounced impact on you and your family's faith walk, where you had to make a decision. And I remember you telling me a story that when you're in eighth grade, eighth grade, your family had to make a major decision. And what happened? So uh, the, the East German government had something like a youth commitment uh, to the uh, uh, communist ideology. Okay, so, every so eighth graders had to make a commitment to communist ideology when they're in eighth grade. Correct. That's a big, big years phrase. Old. Fourteen so years old. All right. It's a big event. You, they, you have to say an oath to the communist ideology. And um, uh, that's when you become you know, a member of the, of the communist uh, society, so to speak. And um, that's a, that is a big, huge event. So once you pass that, you are a real member, a real member of society. So men, all the, um, the restaurants, the theaters were full, uh, families got together from all over the country to celebrate, it. lots of presents. It was, a, it was a rite of passage for an 8th right. grader, for a 14-year-old. 
but it was honoring an atheistic government. Yes, you had, and, to, you had yeah. to say an oath that you believe in that and, and so forth. And you had to go up on a stage and, and say that greed. Mm. Right? Oh my goodness. So that's, uh, knowing that that was obviously uh, a, a very tough thing for me or my family, or me in that case. Right. So, so how did your family deal with it? So the consequence is that they clearly blatantly tell you, if you don't do that, you are not with us, you are against us. So if you ever want to want to go to college or do anything in the society, uh, you'll just shut that door, right? You, you, uh, you know, you're not going anywhere if you don't. So we came up as a family as a compromise where we said, okay, we um, obviously we're not celebrating this in, in any shape or form. But if you, if you just go there, you alone, and you show up, you get the paper, then you have done everything what they want uh, by showing up. But you don't, you know, don't say the oath, just keep your mouth uh, closed and, and come back home. The family doesn't show up, nobody goes there. That obviously will still raise eyebrows, big time, mm. and it did. Oh, good. But that was the compromise where they didn't have anything against me on paper, where they could later on say, you cannot go to university, or you cannot do this or that, or you don't get a car, you don't get an apartment, and any, you know, they, they had control over everything. What happened in your life beyond family that gave you a place to belong? So my biggest place outside of the family was clearly my church youth group. Uh, if you, as I mentioned earlier, if you, with your classmates in school, there's always someone listening, or uh, it's it's not a comfortable environment. While the youth group definitely was for me. I I really adored my youth pastor, and um, uh, and and the friends that I made there, and that we went on trips with, and and so forth. We all having the same reason, going through the same thing, right? Going Sunday to church or to the youth group, you know, you, you share this feeling of being different and doing something that is totally separate from, from the society there. And that, um, you know, knits a closer yeah. net to your yeah. friends. And uh, so you talk, but you're also aware that whenever you have your youth group meeting again, one of you 15 in the group is going to be going to write a report at the end of the month of what was going on, right? Who said what? So you still wouldn't, same rule applies, you wouldn't necessarily say things uh, that you might say in your own home, but it was much, much better. And, and so it was, a, it was a safer environment, safer environment. Uh, than, say, school, and, and you were with other believers. Right. And, and those, those friends, then they become tight because they're all walking the same walk. Correct. Uh, they're all walking the same walk. And they all had to make decisions at 14 what they were going to do. Remember what Jesus said in Luke chapter 4. He said, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Remember that? Today it's fulfilled. No oppression. The blind can see. The poor are set free. Y you see... That's the call of Jesus in an oppressive environment that the people of the day, his day, certainly knew oppression by the Romans. He knew that they were not only oppressed by a government, they were also oppressed in their own lives. And he said, today you are set free by this scripture. It is fulfilled. Paul writes it this way in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. He says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Do you, do you hear this? It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Jesus calls you by name. You belong to Him. No matter what the oppression is, no matter what the controls are, He's called you by name, and you're free. But what Michael tells us is that everyone has two things they've got to wrestle with. And we all wrestle with it. Number one, Michael's family had to make a decision, what does it mean to be a believer in Jesus Christ? And they had to make a literal decision that could impact their son's life, as far as they knew, for the rest of his life 
and he was 14 years old. When you talk to Michael, who, by the way, is a member of our congregation, when you talk to Michael, he didn't care. He was 14. I don't care. I believe in Jesus. I go to my church. I don't care. But the dad and mom looked at each other and said, we have to care because there's implications. There are consequences to everything we're doing right now. You heard him say, if you do not do this, this confession to the atheistic ideology, you won't be able to go to university. You won't even be able to buy a car. You won't be able to rent an apartment. You will always be marks. Jesus said it this way, be as wise as a serpent, innocent as a dove. And the parents made a decision. Quiet resistance. They said, you go. You go to this big event where all the families come together and they're all given their presents and they're having this big party. You go. We aren't going. The family will not go. We will not do presents. We won't do anything. Just go. So when his class got up to do the atheistic creed, committing themselves to communist, the communist mindset, they recited it as a group, and he didn't recite it. His mouth stayed shut. When they went off stage and everybody else went off to the party after the evening was done, people asked, where's your family? He said, well, they're at home. And then he went home. Did that have consequences? Well, yeah, it did have consequences. Not as dire as it would have been, but it did have consequences. And when you talk to Michael, you find that out. There were consequences. But everyone here, folks, we all are put in a position at one point or another of how will we confess our faith in Christ Jesus. Everyone here does. It doesn't have to be a communist ideology. It can be in the freedom of the United States in our day-to-day -day living. But we each have to make a commitment at one point or another. Who are we as people of God? Who am I as a man or woman of God? But the second thing is as important as that decision. You'll notice the most important encouragement to Michael's life was his youth group. Fifteen kids that gathered at their church weekly. It was the one place where he as a believer of Jesus could be with other believers of Jesus, even knowing that there would be a spy among them giving report to the government on what happened in that youth group. It was his place of community. You, you cannot do the faith walk alone. You cannot journey it alone. And the reason his family could quietly oppose the government in their own faith walk is because they were committed to a faith community that they were part of. And you heard his language. He said it very quickly. He said, I adored my, my youth pastor. I just adored him. Here was, here was a man who was showing these kids, these young men and women, how to live out the faith in an oppressive environment, environment that was so resistant. You, you see, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm. Stand firm. Give up the yoke of slavery. Give up the oppression. For freedom, Christ has set you free. Stand firm. We need each other. We can't do it alone. I need you. I do. I need you to speak Jesus into my life. I do. I can't do it alone. I can't. Well, Michael grew up and he became an adult. And let's see the last clip. So... Michael, how in the world did you end up in Ann Arbor, Michigan? So after I finished my college, after the wall fell, I... Uh, so when did the wall fall down again? 89, November 89. November so 1989. That was uh, just three years into my six-year study at uh, university. So I finished my college and then uh, started working at a small startup in East Germany. And we were working with an American company headquartered here in uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan. So after a while of that uh, business relationship, they asked me if I would be willing to help them in the project here uh, at the world headquarters in Ann Arbor. And I said, great, when can I come? Right. So, and they gave me a two-year working visa, and that's how I started and how I ended up here. And that was a two-year visa, and how many years has it been? 
In the meantime, 20 years. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> that's funny. Two year visa became a green card, became this, became that. And I started my family here. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, all this being a big part of my history, uh, as soon as Max and Farah were able to travel. And so, you have two kids, you have two kids, Max and Farah, and, and wife Cat. Wife Cat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wanted them to uh, see some of them, my history and what what uh, what is uh, um, has a deep meaning for me and that was for instance in Berlin the Brandenburg Gate as long as I grew up there was a wall and I could see it from afar but I could never go there mm -hmm. nevertheless through history this is that was the main street of Berlin mm -hmm. this is where everyone would go through it's just the main big street through through the through the capital so I always had this dream or vision that someday I will go through this. And so to go through it then with my family, with Kat, Max and Farah, and actually um, uh, go through from the east and west like it was nothing, like I saw it on old pictures when there was nothing and you could just go, mm -hmm. uh, was, was amazing, very emotional to say the least. So you did it, you took the kids and you walked from east to west, and that when it sunk in for me, all this, you know, this this was like a closing event for me. Where it's like, yep, yeah, I have a family now. I'm free. I'm, you know, I work in America. I come here. You know, this is all different. All these bad people that were after me beforehand and interrogated me and tried to tell me something else, what's what's real and what's not real, all history. They're all lost in history. Mm -hmm. You, you see, the pastors, every time we do confirmation, uh, we, we uh, interview our kids. And the kids come in and we have some questions. We try to make it a real scary moment, uh, very threatening and intimidating. And, and that day, I, I interviewed their son, Max. Mom, Cat came in with, with Max. And I sat with Ron McCarty. And, and the four of us were uh, talking through some questions. And the story of going through the Brandenburg Gate came up, uh, I'm not sure, but uh, we just started talking about a bunch of things about life and faith. And Max started talking about his dad taking them to Germany and walking through Brandenburg Gate. And then Max started getting really emotional. He started to get choked up and, and he couldn't speak. And so the mother finished the story. I looked at the mom. I said, I said, Kat, when, what, what's going on here is Max got overly emotional. And I said, this must, Michael, the dad, he must have really wept. He must have been extraordinarily emotional that the boy here has seen that emotion and he's, he's embraced it. He's, he said, this was my dad and my dad was really broken. And she said, oh, I was taking the picture on the other side as they walked through. And when he walked through, he started to cry. And he wept and he wept. And then he hugged the kids we see the smiles, we don't see the tears. For you see, when you know oppression and you come to freedom, you never want to go back to oppression. You want to go to freedom and go, I am free, praise God, I am free. And it's not about governments and ideology. It's about Christ coming into this world, rescuing the blind and the broken and the hurting and the suffering. And he's calling you to freedom. Freedom. And what we want to do at that moment, when we see the freedom, we want to stand up, look at the heavens, thank God. Thank God I'm free. I am bound by nothing. The heavens, Jesus, my God, entered this world so I might know freedom. No oppression, no pushing down, no squeezing. The box has been busted. If you're in a world feeling really oppressed and you feel like you're squeezed, life, joy just being squeezed out of you, I'm here today to proclaim to you, you are set free. The freedom is yours, it's been given, box destroyed. The grave empty. We are the resurrection people.
You know what brought that wall down in 1989? It was the church. Go back and study it. People began to meet in churches. And they began to pray. And thousands and thousands and thousands of people gathered. It was the call of freedom. The call of freedom. You and I, that freedom is ours. It's the call. Carry the call. Go out into that oppressive world. Carry the call. I'm free. Thank God Almighty. I'm free. In Christ's name. Amen? Amen.